David, we're going to move right forward. And this chair that we've been talking about these nine features of the fruit of the Spirit. And today we're going to be talking about gentleness. And what we're talking about this morning with gentleness goes beyond being courteous and being polite, but it's a reflection of God Almighty who is gentle and loving and caring and patient. And you might think, wait a minute, because we were talking about in Sunday school this morning, I might not see that in the God of the Old Testament, but we can certainly see it in His Son, Jesus, who uh, said words like this, recorded out of Matthew chapter 11, when He said, Come to Me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take My yoke upon you, and learn from Me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your very souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is an invitation from God himself to each and every one yet today. Jesus, fully God and fully man, there was no one like him. And so when we're talking about Jesus, we recognize that Jesus wasn't always gentle and offering these kind of words to to us, we see some of the ways that he handled situations, particularly I love the story when he's going into the temple to the house of God and the house of prayer with fire in his eyes because the house of prayer had been turned into a den of thieves and people had been robbing people there with finances and so Jesus has a little temple tantrum as he goes into the temple and turning tables over. And, uh, and the cool, the interesting thing about this is Jesus doesn't just walk in and raise his voice, right? He has a whip with him. And the scripture says it's a whip that he made with his own hands. I mean, he had premeditated, I'm doing this. I'm going after it. So this is the Jesus that we're talking about that still offers the yoke that's easy. Come to me. Dorothy Say, uh, Sayers writes this about Jesus. This is her perspective. She says, the people who hanged Christ on the cross never accused him of being a bore. On the contrary, they thought him too dynamic to be safe. It has been left for later generations to muffle up this chattering personality and surrounding him with an atmosphere of dullness. We have effectively, uh, sorry, yeah, efficiently cut the claws of the law of the Lion of Judah, certified him meek and mild, and recommended him as a fitting household pet for religious old ladies. <laughs> That's good. Alyssa, <clears throat> That's not the Jesus I'm talking about, right? <laughs> Think about Jesus when he, when he confronted this man who was demon-possessed, who lived in the caves, and people were terrified of him. And remember the name of the demon. The name of the demon was Legion. We pick it up in Matthew chapter 5. Verse 2 says, When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with chains, for he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons with his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stone. This man who lived in the cemetery was to be feared because there were demonic forces at play and he had a strength that went beyond human abilities. And so people would steer, steer clear of this entire area of this hillside. But you know, when Jesus encountered this man, the demon cowered in his very presence because Jesus came with authority. That's the Jesus we're talking about. So when we're talking about a spiritual gentleness that's displayed through Jesus Christ, we're not talking about weak and meek. We're talking about a combination 
of strength and gentleness. This is an incredible combination that we see in the presence of Christ. For example, do you ever notice how Jesus treats women, even women who are outcasts? He treats them with dignity and respect and honor. <laughs> Jesus, full of love and full of grace, full of truth, full of gentleness. Like the time that all the people would come to their children and the disciples were pushing them away, Jesus said, no, 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 let the children come to me. Right? And we could see Jesus playing with the kids and smiling at them, maybe singing a song, laying his hand on them and praying with them and blessing them. This was the gentleness of Christ. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest for my yoke. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. This yoke is not the center of an egg. This yoke that we're talking about is like this beam that went across maybe a couple animals that were like oxen that were pulling a plow. And the idea of this yoke was that it would relieve like 50% of the, the weight of the work for you and would lay it on the other animal, the other person. And it was great because we didn't have to do something all by ourselves. Someone else was there to help carry our weight. And Jesus says, I'm here to help carry the weight for you. Take my yoke upon, upon you. Learn from me. Get into my yoke with me. What is this yoke of Christ? We're going to learn about that in just a second. But I think it's safe to say that if Jesus is pulling with you, he's going to be pulling more than 50% of the weight. Yeah. Okay. And we're not having to do it all on our own strength and our own wisdom. And we try 100%, and we give and we give, and when that isn't enough, we, we struggle to try to give more. But the Bible says it's not by might or by power, it's by the Spirit, says the Lord. It's the Spirit of God that is at work within us to go beyond ourselves to accomplish immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. And when Jesus is, is on the other side with you in this yoke, he isn't like, come on, get up, do this. we got work to do. And Jesus is saying, listen, I am here to help you. I know you're struggling, and, and I'm here to come alongside of you. I want you to be successful. I want you to succeed. And when we end up trying to do things by ourselves, we often find ourselves things getting worse. And Jesus literally is saying, please let me get into this yoke with you. I don't want you to handle this load all by yourself. We can carry this load together. Now for the Jewish rabbi, the teachers of the law, their yoke was the Torah, was the the first five books of the Old Testament, and they would they would take some time to discuss this stuff and process through the Scripture, and as a result, they come up with 613 laws and prophets, and, and this whole thing is, is kind of their yoke that they're working through the Scriptures. And, and so you can imagine when the teachers of the law came to Jesus, Jesus kind of was a little threat to them. And they one day came to him and said, Hey, teacher, what is the greatest law that we've established here through the word of God? You remember the story, Matthew again, now chapter 22, hearing that Jesus had silenced now the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They had gotten together and one of them, an expert of the law, testing him with this question. Jesus or teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? I love what Jesus does here. He takes these 613 laws of the Old Testament, these commandments and these prophets, the prophecies, and he says this out of verse 37. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the laws of the prophets hang on these to commandments. He, he said, let's narrow it all down to loving God and loving people. Folks, that is the yoke of Christ. Loving God. And love. You don't need 613 laws that have been established. This is what Jesus is all about. Christianity isn't supposed to be about a bunch of laws and rules that bog us down. <coughs> The 
focus that Jesus said is about the heart, it's about relationship. And we don't have to look at, play a certain part and look, look a certain way. The intent is coming from the heart. It's not about legalism and performance. We have a heavenly father who is gentle and kind and releases his only son so that Jesus can come and not only say, hey, you need to love God and love people, but he said, listen, I'm going to make it happen so that you can do this. I'm going to go to the cross so that you can come along and experience a love that I put in your heart so that you can have a relationship with God and love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and being so that you can love people like you never thought you could. And in the process, you're going to love yourself because you're going to experience a life that goes beyond you because I'm putting my love in your heart. So Jesus didn't just say, these are the two laws. He said, I'm going to make it possible for you to live that way, and you're going to do it in a way that, that brings life to you abundantly. So then he dies. I think gentleness, when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit, is one of the most overlooked and underappreciated part of the fruit. On one level, gentleness is how we win friends and influence people, but on a deeper level, when we have gentleness at play, it's the kind of thing that encourages us to actually accomplish some of the things that God is calling us to do. Let's be honest with ourselves. If it weren't for gentleness, with a gentle heart, how would we ever build trust in the lives of the people? How could we ever come close enough to them to, to be a part of their lives and let God work in us and through us to encourage them. Let's look at a couple of verses on, on gentleness. Proverbs 15, verse 1 says, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Sometimes we speak out of our insecurities and the combination of things that push people away. But I found that if we're going to really be operating in the true spirit of God, we're going to find ourselves being gentle and kind to people around us. How could I say that? Well, think about how the Spirit of God speaks to us. Think about how the Spirit of God spoke to Elijah when he was in this cave, and he's like, God, I need you to speak to me, right? And, and the thunderstorms and all of this stuff came. We pick it up in 1 Kings 19.12. It says, after the earthquake came the fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And that was good. So why would God speak in a whisper? Because my whisper. I have to stop what they're doing so that they can hear the person talk. Yep. And when we whisper, you have to come close enough to be able to hear what they're actually saying. And I think that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to stop it. Gentleness is when we 
are unafraid of what people think about us and we just start doing what God's calling us to do. Remember when we said a few weeks ago that, that there are two kinds of people, right? People that walk in the room and say, well, here I am. And people that walk in the room and say, hey, there you are. Right? People that are all about themselves and then people that are all about the other people around them. I think the best way to be interesting and to be gentle and to get someone's attention is to take a genuine interest in others. A few other meanings of gentleness are to be calm, to be considerate, to be courteous. And you might say, yeah, see, there's the problem. I'm not really like that. I have, I'm kind of wired a little differently. And sometimes I just, you know, just kind of put it out there. Here's the thing to remember, that gentleness isn't just about personality, characteristic. We're talking about it's one of the fruit of the Spirit. And in one way or another, we need to find ourselves being gentle. Think about the, the gifts of the Spirit, right? The one of the list of the gifts of the Spirit out of Romans chapter 12, these seven gifts are listed. When Paul writes, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophecy, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. And if it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. We can say, well, oh, there it is. I don't have the gift of mercy. And it's truly possible that you don't, but we have to be merciful. We have to be gentle. We have to do some of these things because it is the character of Christ. Amen. And we want Christ to not only be living in us, we want him to be evident to the people around us. Amen. So we exercise that. Maybe one of the most important, effective ways that we can express gentleness is in opposites, right? When someone is frowning, we smile. When someone is having a bad day, we, we try to express a good day. When someone is being conceited, we show humbleness. When someone is rough and aggressive, we become gentle and kind. I close with this illustration. There's a man by the name of Larry Trapp who was in the front pages of many papers across the country in 1992. He was a grand dragon in the KKK. And Larry Trapp, he terrorized the Jewish family in his community with hate mail and threats on the phone and even bomb threats. Well, one day, Larry Trapp did a complete turnaround. He burned his Nazi flags, he destroyed all his literature, and he renounced the KKK entirely. What was the reason for this radical transformation? Here's what happened. Larry Trapp discovered that he was diabetic. He found himself in a wheelchair. He couldn't take care of himself, so guess what? This Jewish family said, why don't you come live with us? And he did, and they loved on him. This is a true story. And they loved on him in such a way that he found a love that goes beyond himself, and he turned his life over to Christ. It's important that no matter what, we show love, we show kindness, we become patient, and we show gentleness. We do what the Spirit of God is asking us to do because we don't belong to the world, we belong to Christ. And Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. It's an invitation. Another invitation is out of Revelation 3.20. I love this image. So many people have seen the paintings. When Jesus said, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens my door, I will come in and eat with that person. And they with me. In other words, we should have fellowship together. Jesus isn't going to beat the door down and pound and ring your doorbell constantly. He's just there gently knocking. And it's an opportunity to open the door. So maybe you're here this morning and you need to just come to Jesus. 
like the song we sang earlier, running to Jesus in his arms, experiencing something <coughs> that reminds us we're not alone. We don't have to carry the weight of the world on our shoulders. Right. He is there to embrace us like the father of the prodigal son. Mm -hmm. to say, Here you are. I've been waiting for you. And we so have to open that door and say, I need to fellowship with Christ. I need to get along and have some time with him. Because he's gently hey. I want to spend time with you. I want to encourage you. I want to pour my power in you. I want you to experience something that goes beyond yourself, like Kathy experienced that. And share it with us today. So wherever you are, whatever it is, this is the gentleness of God. It says, I am a loving Heavenly Father. I've sent you, I've sent my son to you so that you can ex not only express love, but you can experience it in a way that allows you to be my hands and feet part of Christ as we come and we experience the gentleness of Christ. Would you stand with me please as we close the end this morning? God, this word gentleness isn't necessarily always something that we just do as kind of a natural instinct. It's something that we have to get better at, we need to work on, and um, it's powerful, man, it's powerful, I can't, I can't imagine the discussion that Jewish family must have had before they offered their home to this guy who had been ridiculing them, such and tormenting them, but you lay it on our heart to do something that we wouldn't normally do. And it might not only help to cause people to, to stand up to take notice, but it probably surprise ourselves. Because it is in us. It's you. It's you working in us and, and through us in a dramatic way of gentleness. So God, I pray that we would be gentle, not only with the things that we do, but with the words that we say, with the approach that we have, the opportunities that you bring before us to, to take a breath, maybe count to ten, whatever it takes, God, so that we can offer gentleness to the people around us because you were gentle enough to lay your life down for us and offer yourselves to pick up the weight with us and move us forward so that we're together. God, I thank you for these great people that are here and you're continuing to mold us and equip us and empower us and transform us so that we can be the light and hope of Jesus Christ and we can represent you better and better each and every day. So God, no matter what our past has been, no matter how old we might feel we are, we know that you have plans and purposes yet to be fulfilled, and you have chosen us to be a part of those plans and purposes. So God, I thank you that we're not alone, and that we are your body, and we are here to serve, and we are here to, to proclaim your name. Guide us and direct us as we continue to allow you to do what only you can do. We pray in Jesus' name, all God's people say. Amen. Blessings to you. Thank you for being here. Have a great week. Keep these prayer requests in mind as we continue to lift one another up and encourage one another. Yeah,